City of Virginia Beach Development Authority monthly meeting for uh, today's date is June the 15th, 2021. Um, welcome to everyone who's come this morning. It was a parked, uh, the parking garage was full, so it looks like we're going to have a full meeting. Um, the first item on the agenda is the uh, open uh, time allotted to speakers. There's a three minute limit on posted agenda items. And we have the following speakers uh, who have signed up to speak this morning. Uh, Senator Bill DeSteff is here. Senator DeSteff, would you like to take your three minutes? Sure. I'm going to probably be quicker than three minutes. Um, if it's okay, I don't like having my back to anybody. So I'm going to go over here. I apologize for that. And I don't want Lewis to chastise me later but so back when I was on City Council with Rosemary and Lewis we originally started the concept for Vanguard Landing working with Debbie Deere and at the time Pete Kieber and the the background of this is we took our most vulnerable population and we provided a place for them to go for the end of life so it's truly something that the federal government has not done well the state government has not done well and our local government has not done well so this was an opportunity to have a private entity stand up and do what we as the government couldn't do. Um, I got behind this and helped push it. And as a matter of fact, I think this was pretty much unanimous out of city council back then. And since then, as soon as I was elected to the House of Delegates, I started working on the next hurdle, which was CMS Baltimore and working with the DOJ settlement to ensure that we understood what they were trying to push on this and we understood what their intent was. We spent a lot of time, I spent a day straight with the attorney who negotiated the DOJ settlement, and then we worked with DCMS or DMS in Richmond, and more recently with Department of Housing. Well, that's on the other side of what I was doing behind the scenes for seven years to get everything lined up to where we are today, which says DCMS, CMS Baltimore, DMS, everybody can provide Medicaid funding for those who choose, operative word here is choose to live there. You choose to live there, you choose to shop there, you choose to work there or not, or work other places. You choose your place of work, you choose your place of where you want to live, you choose where you get your services, you choose who does your services, you choose where you go to the movies, you choose everything about it. And that freedom of choice is why Vanguard Landing was stood up and structured the way they were, and that's how we got through working with the gentleman who did the DOJ settlement, the three ladies at DCMS, DMS, and then at CMS Baltimore. Um, where we are today, the Department of Housing is reviewing the application, and I'm pretty confident that they're going to approve it and support the funding of this project. Um, DCMS, DMS, CMS Baltimore, um, everybody's doing what they're supposed to do on the other side, working with Debbie to structure this appropriately, and CMS Baltimore has said that this is what we need to do. Freedom of choice is what's in there. Now let me go back and hit seven years ago why I actually stepped up and started taking on the federal government and hiring lawyers who did the DOJ settlements and all this stuff. The reason we did that is because in my neighborhood we have five folks who have Medicaid waivers. When we went through this, they were told one of the, the sixth person who was moving into my neighborhood was told that you can't move in there. There's already five people who live in that neighborhood who have um, Medicaid services. And I said, wait a minute. They choose to live here. They're not forced to live here. They said, we're going to cut out Medicaid services for everybody. I said, you can't do that. You can't tell people where they can choose to live. You can't go to a realtor and say, hey, I want to know how many people who live in this street, on that cul-de-sac, in this neighborhood, have um, Medicaid services. You can't do it. It's against the law. So why is it okay for the government at the time, DMS, uh, DCMS, to say, we're going to pull everybody who has uh, Medicaid services and say, you can't have services because too many of you live in this neighborhood where you choose to live. And I live in Broad Bay Point Greens. If you choose to live there, then three things happen. You want to live there. It's a beautiful area. I think so anyway. And that's where you want to live and choose to live with your family. We have five different people who live on the same street within 10 houses who have somebody who has Medicaid services for one reason or another. They choose to be there so they have somebody, which we call fallback services in the Navy, 
I'm not sure what you call it in civilian life, but they have friends. They, ha they can make a call and say, hey, I've got to go do this. Can you watch my child? Hey, I have to go do this. Can you watch my special needs individual, my intellectually challenged, whatever we want to use, but I call them our most vulnerable population. So that's the concept of why Vanguard Landing was put in place, and that's why I got involved the way I did. Thank you for your time. It's time for me to sit down. I know Lewis has always told me, be brief, be brilliant, and be gone, quickly. <laughs> <laughs> for the speakers, if you don't mind, can you stand behind the podium, because that's where the microphone is, because we like to hear Sorry, Andy. All right. <laughs> you were great. Thank you. Our, our next speaker is Teresa Dixon. Teresa, you've got three minutes. <coughs> got two questions and I'm going to meet really brief. And I hope I can say this. Um, I just would like to know why a 501c3 was able to campaign and fundraise as a charity for a specific, specific politician for around the 10 years that it's been here and still state tax exempt. Um, I think it's a great project, although there's a few red flags that could be construed as public corruption. I hate being here saying this. I thought the city of Virginia Beach was working on transparency and diversity issues but I don't see that happening. And this sounds no different than the recent things that have happened in the Ohio House with their speaker. And that debacle also included a Cincinnati councilman. There's several other cities that you can reference. Hamilton and Dallas, Texas. Jerry Walsh in Magnolia, Arkansas. And as I mentioned, the one in Columbus, Ohio. Please just tell me in the public and put us to ease what's going on here. That's about all I have. Thank you, Ms. Dixon. Our next speaker is Barbara Mesner. I'll take the hallway. I did not see Ms. Mesner. And we do have some uh, call-in speakers, but she wasn't identified as a I do not, I do not see Ms. Messner, and, and I know her from her comments at council meetings. Okay. Uh, next speaker is Dorothy Clark. people with disabilities like me can live in the in, uh, inclusive neighborhoods. I lived in my apartment for 16 years. I talked to people without disabilities. The gentleman that lives right next door to me does not have a disability. I get services from an organization that provides 24-hour services around the clock in the neighborhood regardless of the severity of your disability. So it's been said that people like me, and I know it for a fact, want to live in inclusive, in inclusive neighborhoods, not segregated neighborhoods where the only people that live there have disabilities. They want to live in a regular community, be able to go where they want to go, do what they want to do, and live the life of their own choosing. People with disabilities with the right support can live in an inclusive neighborhood, can work in an inclusive environment, and have friends of both non-disabled and people with disabilities in the same community. So I oppose Vanguard Landing. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Our next speaker is Terry Morgan, who is a call-in speaker. Ms. Morgan, are you on the line? Uh, yeah, if you could just adjust the volume up a little bit. Okay, is that better? Yeah. Wonderful, thank you. We can all hear you now. <laughs> yeah, we sure do. Okay. 
Thank you. Well, good morning, members of the Virginia Beach Development Authority. My name is Terry Morgan, and I am the Executive Director of the Virginia Board for People with Disabilities. I appreciate the opportunity to provide comment on Vanguard Landing, a proposed 185-bed residential and day services development for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. As the Commonwealth works to improve integrated, community-based options for people with disabilities, decisions about development and funding must reinforce the Commonwealth's commitment to true integration and inclusion. According to the Vanguard Landing website, 185 people with disabilities will live, work, and recreate within its confines. At a time when the Commonwealth has closed all but one of the state-operated training centers, this type of development is concerning and raises red flags. However well-intentioned, disability-specific campus settings, like the one proposed by Vanguard Landing, are next-generation models of segregated services. As I mentioned, there are a number of red flags that are indicators of segregation, such as a 185-bed campus where people with disabilities will be the primary people living there. The people who live at Vanguard Landing will receive multiple services, including residential, day services, and social and recreational activities within the campus. People with disabilities will, by default, be isolated from the broader community. <coughs> Vanguard Landing promotes Medicaid waivers as a source of funding for potential residents. Medicaid waiver funding is reserved only for settings where the individual has the same access to workshop, socialize, volunteer, and receive services in the broader community for people without disabilities. Having all of these opportunities occur within the Vanguard Landing community itself is not community integration and does not represent access to the greater community. This is concerning, and the ability of re to receive waiver funding is questionable. Vanguard Landing's website references what is called reverse integration. Reverse integration occurs when a facility or intentional community serving individuals with disabilities invites the general public to join or engage in activities offered within the community. While opening the doors to others without disabilities is positive, it is not in and of itself community integration, according to the Centers for Medical and Services. Increased segregation of people with disabilities is contrary to the progress made by both the Commonwealth and the nation. It is not consistent with the community integration mandate of the United States with Disabilities Act, the Supreme Court's Olmstead decision, and the settlement agreement with the U.S. Department of Justice. Public dollars should not be used in support of this initiative. It contradicts state and federal policy to promote full integration and inclusion of people with disabilities. The red flag extension of concerning indicators of segregation in Vanguard Landing is not a good investment of taxpayer resources. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to, to put on comment. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. Could you state again for the record what your what your title is? Uh, Executive Director of the Virginia Board for People with Disabilities. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you for calling in this morning. Our next speaker is also a call-in speaker, Jesse Monroe. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Good morning. Yes, we can. My name is Jesse Monroe. I'm a developmental disability, and I live individually in my own apartment in the area. I'm a Ms. Monroe, could you speak up just a little bit? We're having a hard time hearing you. Okay, I'm, I'm trying. I'm, I can't catch you. I can only use a speakerphone. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Okay. Well, my name is Jessica Monroe. I I have a disability and I live in my own apartment independently in the area. Uh, we are the key today. I feel like with over 180 disabilities that only those still living in one community is And I'm also a self advocate, so I speak with a lot of people, other people just pay attention. What I found is that. I'm also just at the 
there's been a lot of abuse and other things that happen. And so I do not feel that Thank you, Ms. Monroe. Our last speaker is uh, Dave Redmond, who is here in person. <laughs> everyone for having me and good morning. Before I say another word, I want to thank Senator Bill D. Steff for his leadership on this. It's been an enormous amount of work and he's made a gigantic difference and not many people have the time, ability, and commitment to do that and I sincerely appreciate it. I'm here this morning to support Vanguard Landing and to urge the authority to grant this 18-month extension. I'm extremely proud of my 20-year-old autistic daughter graduate from Princess Anne High School on Thursday with a standard diploma. What an extraordinary accomplishment for a very challenged young woman. We don't know exactly what her future holds. She may live with her parents. She might be able to live independently with friends or roommates. I know she'd like to. Or she might live in a supportive group environment like Vanguard Landing. But I know she will need choices. She will need options. What she does not need, what anyone with a, with a developmental disability does not need, is to be pigeonholed, to be patronized, to be discounted, marginalized, or to be lied to. The notion that anyone would be institutionalized at Vanguard Landing is a lie. Vanguard Landing is a place where one would voluntarily join. This worthy project is being attacked by selfish special interests who don't want Vanguard Landing providing an alternative to their own service, and who, very frankly, just want their money. This is a money grab, folks, pure and simple. Don't fall for it. The sole determinant of your action today should be the best interests of special needs individuals. And I know special needs individuals need choices. They need options. They need alternatives. Vanguard Landing has been delayed by the enormous complexity of land development in the Back Bay watershed today. But it's allied now with community leaders and business people with proven track records of getting things done. There is no valid or justifiable reason whatsoever for this body to deviate from City Council's prior direction on Vanguard Landing. It needs and deserves your support. So I urge you to grant this extension and provide greater choices and alternatives for the strong, <coughs> resilient, persevering, and beautiful individuals. But the one under my roof, doubtless, Thank you very much, Mr. Redman. If the applicants' council would like to speak, I think that's the um, last. Person. Yeah, if you if you'd like to say something in just a few minutes. No, this is three minutes. Thank you, uh, Chair sure. Murphy. For the record, Eddie Bradon, Virginia Beach attorney, and you all listened to me last month. So, um, I won't belabor the point. I don't think I could speak as eloquently as Mr. Redmond or uh, Senator Steph did. The one thing I do want to um, clear up a little bit, uh, and I, I don't read the internet, you all know me, I don't play that <coughs> game, um, but I don't look at anybody's website. But I do know for a fact that. Vanguard Landing will not be a 100% segregated community. There will be 
residents of, Land, of Vanguard Landing who are, let me see, what's the term? Um, neurotypical. Neurotypical, thank you. Um, if someone in Vanguard Landing is married to a neurotypical individual or a neurotypical individual wants to move into Vanguard Landing and there is um, room for them and they want to live there, they certainly can. There is no segregating in that now. We are in a position as a society, as a state, that the regulations as to um, you know, what's, what's required, what's not required, we, they're not settled yet, uh, but this has never been intended to be a 100% segregated um, community at all. And it's only for people who want to live there. But it is, I think, beyond um, reproach that there will be people who are, who are neurotypical. The Virginia Housing may place some specific um, you know, guidance as to how many uh, neurotypical residents need to be there or how many um, disabled individuals um, must be there on a percentage basis. We don't know that yet. That's a part of why it's a very complicated loan review process that Virginia Housing is going through because this is far from settled. It is very unfortunate though that this whole debate has come up in the realm of a simple audit that I compliment uh, the city auditor for doing um, and for uh, kind of helping a Vanguard Landing move uh, forward in a more cohesive way with the city. Um, and we have done exactly what the authority requested and provided exactly what the authority requested uh, last month. Uh, and all we're asking for is the opportunity to finish this project. As I think all of you know, um, and as you all requested, uh, the Vanguard Landing has brought on Mr. Mike Siphon, uh, and he is going to be the person who will um, shepherd this through the approval process, which we've already gotten our first set of comments back. We're resubmitting in the next week uh, this, the, the second review, and we certainly uh, be happy, I'm happy to answer any questions that any of you may have. And I did attempt to answer uh, some of the questions that uh, Chairman Murphy uh, posed and provided a letter to the city attorney and to deputy city manager um, Taylor Adams. If you have any questions, I'm happy to try to answer. Question. I, I have a question. So you mentioned neurotypical, and it, it strikes me that we're, for some reason, not far enough along in the process with Virginia Housing to know the answer to this question. But does that mean that there would be other folks with vouchers or subsidies living in the housing? Would that be a requirement, likely? So not just disabled, but lower income. Uh, uh, Richard, do you want to? You have an answer to that? Because I'm sorry, I'm not the. Uh, I don't know all the answers. I apologize. I'm just a new attorney who's learned a lot in the last 60 days. <laughs> Choice. <clears throat> I don't want to provide any. I can answer any of this. Not accurate. Eddie, I can answer any of this. The answer is no. It's going to be by choice for those that are neurotypical and those that with intellectual disabilities. Uh, there's going to be no vouchers there for low income or anything like that. No, but it's going to be mixed use. Just everyone. No, Chair, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. That's a question. Yes. Uh, when you say mixed use, is it is it simply um, is this the first time Virginia Housing has done this this sort of project? And I, I work with Virginia Housing all the time, and, and I do know the process takes some time. Um, and so I, I certainly understand um, if you just started, just got the application in the last few months, it could take up to a year. And I'm, I'm working on a deal right now, it took 11 months, and it's not that hard. And so uh, that was more my question. So it's just this is their first type of program, so they're, they're kind of walking their way through it, correct? You're correct. We had to go through the executive committee to get the policy with Senator stuff to get the policy of it. And then they realized that this is a great need, great service. It fits their mission. And with Senator DeStuff and others, um, they believed in the concept. They wanted to do it, and they wanted to move forward. Uh, as you, you are correct, it, it normally takes about a year, give or take, for the application to fully go through with anything or any project that they do. 
This project is taking a little bit longer <coughs> due to COVID, the government being shut down, uh, people teleworking, you know, for at least six months to a year. Plus, on top of that, still going through the policy and the procedure process and going through their attorneys to make sure that we're compliant with all state and federal regulations and laws. And the new ones that are that can be coming down at any point in time. I think it's also very positive that uh, you, <clears throat> you got Mr. Siphon involved, who I, I know is very able to get uh, anything he wants accomplished. Now, is Mr. Siphon a development partner or is he just helping with the permitting? He, like I, am doing this gratis for, for Vanguard Landing. There's no, no partnership, there's no financial remuneration. Last question when, did, when was the Virginia housing application filed? Originally, a year ago, I would say about a year ago, and then more recently we scaled it down um, several months ago. <clears throat> Nothing's really changed, uh, you know, because of the cost of construction and stuff, so we scaled some of it back and resubmitted it, but everything stayed the same, and they're still in the review, part, uh, in the review process. Would, one last question. Would you define scaling it back? What do you, what do you, what do you mean by scaling the project back? Uh, simple. Virginia housing deals with housing. Okay. And if you look at the maps and stuff of Vanguard Landing, we had a couple of barns or stables and stuff, so we just took those out and we can capital fundraise on them and focus on the needs and what is necessary to get a, a Vanguard Landing up and running and operational. Okay. So they're just funding the housing piece of it. If there are stables uh, involved yeah. and there's um, a separate facility not far away, and hopefully we'll be able to, you know, to raise the funds to put those in in the future, but they would still be able to use extra kids if that doesn't happen. Yeah. All right. um, any other questions from any of the development authority members? All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. At this time, the chair will entertain a motion to recess into a closed session pursuant to exemptions from open meetings allowed by Section 2.2-3711A, Code of Virginia, as amended for the following purposes. Legal matters, consultation with legal counsel and briefings by staff members or consultants pertaining to actual or probable litigation where such consultation or briefing in open meeting would adversely affect the negotiating or litigating posture of the public body. A consultation with legal counsel employed or retained by a public body pursuant to specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711A7 and contracts discussion of the award of a public contract involving the expenditure of public funds, <coughs> including interviews of bidders or offerers and discussion of the terms or scope of such contract where discussion in an open session would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711A30. And we'll wait out. Let's do the motion the okay, second. Just don't worry. Oh, yeah. All right. Can I get a motion? We've got a motion from uh, Mr. Strange and a second from Mr. Franklin. Okay. Who was the second? Uh, Mr. Franklin. Yes. 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 Lisa Murphy. Yes. Yes. Virginia Beach Development Authority of the City of Virginia Beach has convened a closed meeting on this date pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act 
and whereas Section 2.2-3712 of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by this Virginia Beach Development Authority that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law, now therefore be it resolved that the Virginia Beach Development Authority of the City of Virginia Beach, Virginia, hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, one, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed session to which this certification applies, and two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered by the Virginia Beach Development Authority. Can I get a motion on the certification of the closed session? So moved. Second. So uh, Mrs. Wood and a second by Mr. Strange. Vicki, would you call the roll, please? And David Byrne. Stepped out. Ian Brown. Yes. William Brunke. Yes. Taylor Franklin. Yes. Lisa Murphy. Yes. Joe Strange. Yes. Deidre Weissenseal. Yes. Scott Wood. Yes. All right, that uh, convenes the closed session. Uh, we had one person signed up for the uh, public speaking public comment section, Barbara Mesner, who I believe is with us now. She's right here. Barbara, would you like to step up to the podium? You've got three minutes to provide us with your comments. Council appointed taxpayer funded uh, commissioners and liaisons who have a major conflict. Council cannot appoint themselves to be a liaison. Um, I followed Vanguard since 2010 when it was misrepresented by John Moss and Bill Disseth, who I supported. It was supposed to be a self contained nonprofit, which should have been had a private bank loan. Um, they used it for political fundraisers, including ads run for uh, Bill De Staff. Um, okay, December 10th, 2013, uh, the votes for this project, a $2.89 million loan that was a surprise for most of us who had followed it for, for 10 years, and I've called on... Uh, the auditor to look into this for several years. Um, the votes were by the Steph, Jones, Wood, Wilson, Henley, Dyer, and Moss. Um, this is total malfeasance of air tax dollars and their debt. Um, we need to cut all waste, fraud, abuse, and abolish the Virginia Beach Economic Development Authority because it sells and leases their land and creates debt. It has not, um, and I want to make, um, you know, the other person that, there's three people I've worked with, but they, you know, they didn't complete their sentence. I want to make that part of the record. And this is, this is the votes that were taken. So, um, and there's conflicts. Don Sykes, uh, Mr. Dehan, but to see Lewis Jones sitting here and Rosemary Wilson, and we have all these votes tonight that should be on separate nights, including how we vote. So, yes, I appreciate Mr. Taylor, and um, like I said, all these props, this is not for all people with disabilities. It was, it was nothing was ever built. And there were props from day one at uh, Yotini's um, yogurt. And I took pictures. I helped. I believed in these people. They do not deserve, uh, air money needs to be uh, returned every penny. And I don't care where they work to, to return air money. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Messer. Uh, Senator, we'll move on to the rest of the open session items. Yes, Madam Chair, quick question. So, so, Madam Chair, looking at, as we, are, as we are, have, uh, are over the time for which we normally 
obligate you today. I'm going to recommend that we remove items 3, 4, 9, 10, and 11 from this agenda. I believe that we can, we can knock out the rest of these very quickly. And, um, um, and, uh, and get, you, get, get us back on track if that's possible. Okay. Um, don't we need to take action on number nine? You can resolve that. Um, if you have time, we can do yeah, that. Yeah, I think we, we can, can do it in like two minutes. Yeah, yeah I think we, we can do it in two minutes. Okay, so we'll keep nine and we're crossing out three, four, and ten. Is that where you ended up? And eleven. All right, so uh, on the matter of the Vanguard Landing request for continued loan forbearance, um, the Chair will entertain a motion. Madam Chair, I make a motion that the Development Authority adopt a resolution approving continued forbearance on loan to Vanguard Landing, Inc., subject to the following terms. Forbearance will continue for 12 months until June 15, 2022. Additional terms in one, borrower shall make quarterly written reports to the lender describing all progress in A, obtaining site plan approval, B, obtaining debt financing currently completed through Virginia <coughs> Housing, and C, raising sufficient funds to satisfy capital equity requirements. Two, within 60 days of the date of this resolution, borrower shall make lump sum principal payment of 500000 on amounts outstanding under the promissory note. Three, in the event of a breach of the terms of this resolution, staff is directed to initiate foreclosure of the loan. Four, the remaining funds owed the development authority shall be paid at closing of debt financing. That is my resolution. I have a motion uh, from Mr. Bronke. Can I get a second? Second. So we've got a motion and a second. All in favor of the proposed motion say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Thank you all. Um, the next item on the agenda is the review and approval of the meeting minutes. Chair will entertain a motion on the approval of the meeting minutes. Motion to approve. We've got a motion for Mr. Franklin and a second for Mr. Strange. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Um, next item, Innovation Park. Most story short, we've got um, um, a nice pending announcement. We hope. Uh, it's the sale of three and a half acres uh, in the Innovation Park. I'll let you read the, uh, the disclosures there. You know, quickly. Um, you can see this is uh, important to note. This is not Libra USA, but this is a this is a supplier of Libra, specifically of powder coating services. Um, we carved out a small parcel near the BMP, uh, excuse me, in the Innovation Park that is currently available. Um, we anticipate that there'll be a 20,000 square foot facility coming with a $7 million investment and 35 new FTEs. Um, and we're asking for uh, approval to move forward with the, with the sale of three and a half acres at 120,000 an acre, which is consistent with your last appraisal. Taylor, would you go back up to the slide just to kind of orient everybody to show us where it is? Uh, yeah. The Sand Road, the, the road, of course, that we built to, uh, uh, to access the Innovation Park. Acoustical sheet metal is here. This is the land that was sent, sold to Tony DiSilvestro for his office park, and this is the parcel that we're talking about. This is uh, um, this 150 feet of right of way is what most of you know as the, as the Southeastern Expressway. So we're we're using basically a remnant parcel that snugs up next to this uh, to this BMP. Um, it's three and a half acres total. Uh, it's actually a nice use of, of a it's a nice use of a small parcel that we have we have remaining for uh, for for a nice expansion. Thank you, Taylor. Any questions, for Mr. Adams? All right, so the um, chair will entertain a motion on the request for approval of the resolution authorizing the sale of 3.5 acres in Innovation Park. Motion to approve. Got a motion for Mr. Franklin. Second. For Mr. Weissen. <laughs> All in favor of that motion say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Uh, next item is a request for approval of the expenditure of 
$18,636.74 for capital repairs to the drainage systems at uh, the golf course, Virginia Beach National. That's right. Uh, um, Madam Chair, I'll be very brief on this one. Of course, as you, as you know, the authority owns Virginia Beach National. We, we lease it to the, um, to the, uh, to the team that is uh, basically Heritage Golf Club LLC led by, by Duncan uh, and Pro there. Um, long and short of it is we've had our, our drainage system there is it's old and it's time for uh, for improved maintenance. We do have a funded reserve um, for this that we basically we we put proceeds into our reserve of course maintenance every year. Thank you, sir. <laughs> no, no questions for Mr. Adams. We've got a motion to, to approve from Mr. Byrne and a second. Second. From Mr. Franklin. All in favor of that motion, say aye. 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 All opposed. Same sign. That motion carries. Uh, next item number seven, Mr. Adams. Um, this is this is a quick amendment to a resolution that we've already done. Um, this is for uh, um, the, I believe it was a thirty-nine million dollar uh, 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 tax exempt bond financing package that we did for the folks that are uh, bringing back the Atlantis apartments. And um, this is uh, it's now been to the council. This is a, this is a approval uh, document execution. All right. Any questions for Mr. Adams? Chair, will entertain a motion. Madam Chair, I'm, I'm going to abstain from this vote. Okay. Uh, let the record reflect Mr. Franklin is abstaining. Any questions or a motion from the group? Second. Second. Got a motion. I think it was Dr. Brown and a second from Mr. Bronke. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Madam Chair, one quick thing that we always remind the public of. Whenever we do industrial revenue bond issues or tax exempt financing, that is not your debt or the city's debt. We're just a, a conduit for the. That's correct. Dana, welcome. Thank Alex, you. Alex owes you big time, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, I in your package is generally a ministerial action um, to initiate a community development authority. The owners of the property need to petition the city for the creation of the authority um, for the dome site, EBVA is the owner, and so this is actually the initiating step for the CDA. The CDA is a tool to finance a portion of the uh, dome site project. It will assist in uh, parking, it will assist in streetscapes, and in essence it is a way to leverage some state sales tax that's coming back to the city, some admissions tax that are generated on site, and then some other um, sales type taxes, so meals um, that are generated and would otherwise go into tip fund. So in essence, what we're doing is we're taking these uh, performance-based or but-for taxes and then we're working them through the CDA and then it's going to be an issuance of debt. We anticipate between the two phases of the project, there will be $5 million a year. The CDA will be stood up for roughly 20-year term. The CDA will actually be, the members will be city council. but. What we're talking about today is simply the initiating step, which is the petition by the landowner to get it all started. So that's the resolution on your agenda. And Dana, this was part of the plan from yes. the beginning for Yes, yes. so uh, if you will, the uh, developer is $220, $250 million. The city's portion is an entertainment facility and some parking structures. And then there's this third piece of kind of the city participates, the developer sort of earns it, the sort of but for piece. That's what the CDA does. And so this is contemplated in the development agreement, and it really is um, just a financing tool. Any questions? Any other questions? Thank you. We appreciate you being here. Carolyn, entertain a motion on the request for approval of the dome site resolution. So moved. Second. Got it. Motion for Mr. Brunke, a second for Ms. Wood. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign, that motion carries. Uh, number nine, request for approval of the award made to Apex Systems. So this is a clarification, um, an addendum, uh, I guess a clarification to our resolution that we had approved on June 2020 for Apex Systems. Um, here's the disclosures. About the company, um, Apex Systems, subsidiary based ASGN, um, this project was a headquarters relocation from California to Virginia. They have 70 markets and approximately 4,000 4, workers in Virginia. 
This project was unique because it involved Henrico, well, they're in Northern Virginia, but didn't include them. So this project involved Henrico, Roanoke, and Virginia Beach. Um, the Virginia Beach location is located here in the town center. Um, overall, the project for the state of Virginia was a capital investment of $12.4 million, 700 new jobs uh, all across Virginia with an average salary of $92,000. The Virginia Beach portion was 147 jobs, capital investment of $1.8 million, um, and it is a staffing company, so their, their role is to assist IT companies in finding employees or assist companies that need an IT project. Um, assistance with an IT project, you know, they hire someone to come in, do what they need to do, and then they can move on to the next project with another company. Um, and our idea for this was it'll recruit professional talent to the city. Um, there was, the, what was approved in 2020 was a 350,000 EDIP Part A match uh, for a Commonwealth Opportunity Fund of 350,000 for the Virginia Beach site specifically. Um, there have been concerns with this resolution <coughs> and with this project um, because we want to make sure that it's consistent with the partnering localities, meaning Roanoke, Henrico, and us. We're all kind of under the same guidelines. Um, there's also uh, concerns over temporary or permanent um, placement. This is a staffing company, so it is much different than any project that we've worked before because it's yes, a staffing question. company. Um, and there was concerns over what is the formula for full-time equivalent employee. So what we did was we took what VDP is um, using as a, I guess, threshold and what Henrico and Ron Roanoke is doing, and we're, we would like to adopt a new resolution to make sure that all um, everything we're doing is consistent with other localities and our partners. Um, and overall, what our full-time equivalent formula is, a full-time employee is equivalent to 1,600 um, hours, and it'll work at least 35 hours. But this employee can work you know, say Apex has a client in Virginia Beach, they can work at that, their one client's facility for three months, finish a project, and then move on to another project. So it is not traditional like our other um, other projects that we've worked in, other companies that we've worked with. So this is how the state and Rico and Renault is qualifying a full-time employee. So our, well, questions, but our, um, I guess for you is if we can adopt this new resolution. <laughs> Sorry, try to go fast. Laura, one, one question that I had, and I think we talked about this a little bit. How do we know that they've been around for a year if we're coming up with a formula for jobs as opposed to employees? They're having to report it. So they're having to report to us their start date, and then they have to report to us how long they've worked and how many hours they've worked. So employee number one, no matter where they work, is only going to count for one year in that formula. And they cannot go over 1,600 hours, 1,680 hours. So an employee, so they can't double count one employee. So one employee can't go work for 3,000. Count is so this, is, this is a little bit different than what we've done in the past. Um, there, was, there was some questions and concerns about it. Um, we don't have a status quo with staffing companies. So that's why we wanted to come to you and make sure that everyone was clear on this project and what we're qualifying as a full-time Yeah, and I think when we when we approved this, it was 147 employees. In our mind, an employee works for an employer and not. Yeah, so they'll work. It'll get shared. Right, and but all payroll will go through, um, will go through the Virginia office. So Apex Systems employs that person. They just might not work at Apex office because they might work for one of Apex's customers. But they're getting paid by Apex. I'll move it. Oh, any it. questions first? I, I'll have some comments. Okay. This, this is back before because of questions I raised when being presented a check to sign. Mm -hmm. um, and looking at the backup and support and Drawing on my recollection of the original presentation and the impressions that I had at that time, and I've since gone back and rewatched the presentation, and I still have the same impression that I had the first time. And the impression that I was under was that we were bringing 147 new jobs to Virginia Beach who were going to be working in the staffing industry, 
who in turn would be recruiting IT professionals to Virginia Beach to fill other positions. And I even believe, I don't want to quote because I don't have the presentation in front of me again, but it was presented almost like a double win that we're receiving this 147 jobs and we're doing placing. And then when I looked at the supporting documentation for the checks, I, I just became concerned that I'm looking at folks that are making $15 an hour, darn near the minimum wage in some states and soon to be in Virginia, who worked somewhere for four days and they were included in a calculation that we were writing a check for. We're in effect subsidizing the employment agency, the temporary agency's revenue stream. These jobs exist not because of the temporary agency. These jobs exist because of other businesses in Virginia Beach, and those are the businesses that created the jobs and created the openings. Um, I, I, I completely swung and whiffed on this one when I heard that first presentation yeah. and still feel that way. And I, I don't know, I, I, I'm just troubled by the whole thing. It wasn't, it wasn't our intention, and so that's how we presented it. Okay. I'll speak to that, Madam Chair, if I can quickly be recognized. Sure. That's 100% our miss. And so uh, um, I made that presentation. And, and Mr. Rumpf, to your point, that's how I understood the deal at that point as well. It's important to note this is the first time the Commonwealth has ever done a multi-jurisdictional Commonwealth Opportunity Fund grant. Um, Laura can tell you we had, we had robust conversation with them over six months leading up to this award where we tried to get comfortable in the way that we presented it. And the way that you just described it is how I understood it at the time. What we now know as, we, as we've gotten into this and the project is performing is that uh, that, uh, that that is not how this is performing. And so I apologize for the, um, for the miscommunication, um, but like I say, what I will tell you is the way that we described it is the way that we understood it after, after a very complex dialogue with the Commonwealth. As we now see it's performing is something different, but that's, that's my fault. I made that presentation and apologize. And now we're locked in on 350,000. Yeah, yes, sir, we are. And I think all we can do is, uh, I mean, we can only look at it the way the, the state and the other localities, at least we share a formula. Yeah, that's I mean, what I'm looking for now, it's consistency. Not, it's not optimal, but at least we're using the same formula as they are um, in how we approach it. And I'm curious to whether our authorizing documentation allows us to do it this way, but we've already committed to it. So that may be something that we have to look at in our, in our policies going forward. We do. we do another staffing company. We'll yeah. live and learn. All right. So uh, I think at this point, unless there are any more questions for Laura or for Taylor, the chair will entertain a motion on this request to clarify what the original resolution was or should have been. Looking for a motion, guys. So moved. <laughs> so we've got a motion for Dot and a second. Joe. <laughs> and a second from Joe. All in, all in favor of the proposed clarification say aye. Aye. All opposed? Same sign. That motion carries. Thank you, Laura. I used to do that too. All right. Uh, administrative information. Um, sorry, I think we're skipping the district improvement. Unless they're time sensitive. Here already. I mean, we're here. Why, we're here. why don't you go ahead? Sure. Quick. It's one last, uh, the last of our first round of small business. Sure. This is item 11. Have, literally one. Yeah, slide. this is item 11. Back on. Sorry we keep doing this to you, Emily. We won't. Um, remember, we were here in uh, April and then last month with our first round of grants for the district improvement grant. These are small matching grants. Uh, performance-based after the fact we um, reimburse them um, this is the final one we had hundred thousand dollars available this is the final one of um, the tenth uh, that we're awarding Starting, um, there are ten thousand dollars for froggies on shore drive for uh, patio upgrade improvements weatherization and then circulation and safety improvements of the parking lot they're gonna have to walk, walk off the shore drive and little entrances to improve the circulation through there with the planters um, see the disclosures for ten thousand dollars do it this so moved. Second. Okay, so thank you very much, Emily. We appreciate all that you do. We've got a motion from Ms. Wood and a second from Mr. Brunke on the request to approve a resolution uh, for a one grant under the district improvement program. 
All in favor of that motion say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Um, any, uh, Taylor, are we going to dispense with the director's report? I, I just need to get into closed session as quickly as Okay. Can. All right. So, uh, hearing nothing further, the chair will entertain a motion to recess into a closed session pursuant to the exemptions from open meetings allowed by Section 2.2-3711A, Code of Virginia, as amended for the following purposes. Publicly held property, discussion or consideration of the acquisition of real property for public purpose or of the disposition of publicly held real property where discussion in an open public meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711A3. Personal matters, the protection of the privacy of individuals in personal matters not related to public business pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711A4. Prospective business or industry. Discussion concerning a prospective business or industry or the expansion of an existing business or industry where no previous announcement has been made of the businesses or industry's interest in locating or expanding its facilities in the community pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711A5. Public funds investment. Discussion or consideration of the investment of public funds where competition or bargaining is involved where if made public initially the financial interest of the governmental unit would be adversely affected pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711A6. Confidential records, discussion or consideration by a responsible public entity or an affected local jurisdiction, as those terms are defined in Section 56-557 of confidential proprietary records excluded from this chapter pursuant to Subdivision A56 of Section 2.2-3705 and pursuant to code section, Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711A29. Uh, that is the entertainment of a motion. So moved. Second. A motion from Mr. Brunke, a second for Ms. Wood. A roll call vote. David Byrne. Yes. 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 William Brown. Yes. William Brunke. Yes. Taylor Franklin. He stepped out. Lisa Murphy? Yes. Joe Strange? Yes. Gunter Weisenseel? Yes. Scott Wood? Yes. 